Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. It brings me full circle to where I was with my dissertation research 20 years ago, um, looking at quality of life issues. And I, I think I've realized from this, from today's workshop, that I'm in the wrong place, that I shouldn't be with the architects and the planners um, at my school, but actually the uh, public health practitioners because you've got you all have been getting it right you've been doing it for a long time and I remember um, probably over a decade ago I was out in Oakland uh, for a national charrette Institute um, training session and there was a woman from who was a nurse who was actually there trying to understand the charrette process and, and it, it's always stuck in my mind that uh, the public health, uh, the, the nurses and other um, members of the medical community have been looking at these issues in a way that architects and planners have kind of forgotten. But the American Institute of Architects and the American Planning Association and the Urban Land Institute have all been working on these issues. So I'm, I'm going to give kind of broad brush issues, um, generalizations, and things that I think our observations, um, which I made a couple of days ago as opposed to today, but it's kind of smiling throughout the presentation saying, oh yeah, <laughs> I think I did put together the right kind of slides. So first I want to start, I, I started teaching a class called Healthy Cities, Livable Places a few weeks ago and uh, to, to the architecture and planning students, actually all of my students are architecture students, and started with this definition um, from the World Health Organization, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirm if infirmity. And someone earlier said that health is not a personal issue, that it impacts the entire community and certainly with health costs and burdens uh, that are placed, uh, that the individual places on the system, you know, we have a great deal to do um, with individual behavior, but it's those places where people live where we should be fostering well-being. And some of the things, some of the places, I, some of the issues I think that we should deal with are first mobility. And, you know, you'll, we know the impact that um, the 1949 uh, Highway Act or Housing Act and federal funding did to our cities in terms of uh, putting, uh, t uh, cutting through and dividing our communities um, because of slum, the federal funding for slum clearance. But how do we, as planners, particularly and architects, uh, stitch those neighborhoods back together so that we can connect people with the places that they go to and enjoy um, and how can we use these same highways um, as generators of activity in ways that we haven't seen recently. Um, the example on the top is you know, a typical very different scale than the previous slide but a very typical uh, community or road corridor that is auto-dependent, auto-oriented. And I forget the actual person who, um, where this quote is, but he said, when we make places for cars, we get places for cars. When we make places for people, we get places for, we get people who are engaged and active in our community. So the bottom, the after slide, uh, shows where we can make our communities uh, attractive to different modes of transportation, different tr modes of mobility, the, uh, the sidewalk with the, the widened sidewalk, the bike lanes, the light rail and so forth, you know, the, the, the trees that provide shading and other amenities um, are very important. But places like these, on the bottom slide rather, uh, address the multiple modes of travel and address the varied mobility needs and levels that are, are necessary. And so here in Washington, and I'll, I'll say that I'm a near native Washingtonian. My family moved here when I was seven, so um, the nat people who are born here don't let me say I'm native. But um, I've been here and I've seen, you know, 
for a long, very long time uh, how our city has changed. And so many of the things that Brenda and, and Gregory were talking about this morning, I've seen actually in, in action. And one of those things that's been really great has been the Capital Bike Share Program and how it is one of the programs in our region that's helping people to become more active, uh, get out of their cars uh, with this shared bike facility. H have any of you used those uh, stations, use, use those bikes? That's great. And so it connects these dead zones uh, between metro stations or places where uh, people are, are going. And it's not just a progr uh, program that's unique to Washington. It's in many other jurisdictions like New York City and Minneapolis. And you'll see at the bottom, um, these are some of the other jurisdictions um, in addition to D.C., Arlington, Virginia. Um, Alexandria, Montgomery County, uh, the City of College Park, the University of Maryland, and Rockville, Maryland. Thank you. Rockville, Maryland um, also have the bike share program. And just a snapshot of the stations, you see that there's a heavy concentration in the urban parts of the region. The downtown, certainly. The downtown. The downtown and the here is the border of Washington and so we see that uh, when you get out into Prince George's County in particular in these areas and certainly beyond into uh, lower density higher income neighborhoods you don't see the bike share uh, stations but we can't have bike share uh, or more cyclists on the road without developing infrastructure that supports them and keeps them safe. And so these are just some examples from the city where uh, we have uh, fostered the, excuse me, we're fostering the, uh, the cyclists who are shifting from uh, recreational cyclists to commuter cycling. And here, uh, an example, not from Washington, D.C., but a, a, a bike uh, lane that protects people, protects cyclists, protects cyclists from automobiles, but also protects them from pedestrians, uh, which in our city has, you know, people have become very, walking much, much more um, over the past four years than they ever had been. And so walk score, has been, is a great measure to see how walkable your community is, but it doesn't tell you what you can't get to. I live in a neighborhood um, that has a very low walk score. I live in American University Park, has a walk score of maybe 68. I'm a, a mile from the metro station. Uh, there are very few uh, shops. They're, they're there in Tenley Town, but not um, exactly where I live, so walk, sc walk score isn't a really good measure for neighborhoods like mine. And, um, you know, we should look at other countries like Bogota, Colombia, to, sorry, Bogota, Colombia, to see what they're doing. Um, this example that is, is often heralded by um, Enrique Pinalosa, who was the mayor of Bogota. Uh, you know, this is an example, and, and many of you may know his, his quote of taking a $30 bike or making sure that a person with a $30 bike has the same value as a person with a $30,000 car. And so the promenade connects neighborhoods, um, of particularly low-income neighborhoods, to goods and services. Um, and, and through this, through his, um, uh, during his, excuse me, during his, uh, tenure, he transformed the city's landscape and democratized public spaces in Bogota. He added, uh, you know, hundreds of miles of sidewalks and, and bike paths and greenways as well as parks. And so sometimes it's just as simple as making places safe, making the sidewalks safe for pedestrians by adding, you know, a setback from the street pedestrian scale lighting, uh, planting strips with trees, and then again, kind of a minimum sideway width so that people feel safe and protected from the automobile.
and, and combining open space with pedestrian access with an open space network is also uh, very important. So the next thing is land use. And we talked about that uh, throughout the day, but you know, most of the 19th or the 20th century was, um, we saw a development that separated land uses. And we've since then seen a return to the city and uh, more mixed use development, transit oriented development, um, and the desire to create destinations um, so that people have a place to walk to. You know, walkability is great, but you've, you need a place to walk to. Um, and places that they, they can access within a quarter mile. And so places, destinations like this, which I believe is in uh, uh, Tampa Bay, um, but mix, mixed use development where the, the neighborhood comes together, uh, you know, to watch it, it looks like that's the, um, the Wizard of Oz, you know, people coming together to, for a movie and other different activities. Or this here in Washington, Columbia Heights, which the trigger was across the street, the um, development that includes Target and other big box retailers. And um, Harriet, Harriet Tregoning, who is the former director of, of the DC Office of Planning, who, who now is at HUD, you know, used to talk about how people didn't think that Target would work here in the city or work in an urban setting. And um, she said, you know, I actually, I've actually seen people carrying 50 inch screen, uh, uh, flat screen TVs from the store. And as I drive around, um, I see people, you know, <laughs> I don't know how it's possible, but <laughs> maybe two people. But um, I've seen bags, target bags, you know, a mile and two miles away, and there's been a great need for um, this type of retail in the city. And downtown Silver Spring, Maryland, another example of, of mixed use, bringing the community together, but creating these places that people want to go to and enjoy. And this uh, open space, this plaza is, is at once a playground for the children, but also a place where you see in the background or the left side of the photograph, you know, merchants are set up. Um, it's a flea market, farmer's market, but a great space for the neighborhood. And then this example from uh, South Orange, New Jersey, uh, you know, traditional train station, train tracks up here, um, I think this was from several years ago. I, I was there visiting a friend of mine, and she pointed out that they had done quite a bit of work to infill and provide the, the types of uh, shops that would cater to people who were commuting. So as you're going to catch the train to go into Manhattan, for instance, you can stop and get coffee or drop your clothes off at the cleaners. So these were... Uh, transforming single-use development into uh, a multi-use development that caters to the needs of the community. The other thing is food access. And we've talked quite a bit about this today, but um, access to healthy food choices is, you know, major. And so in many communities, this, this is the example. Um, this is what's available to, to the residents. Um, and I'd add that there are an abundance of liquor stores as well. And so the Department of Agriculture and the Centers for Disease Control you know, produce this map that you know, indicates how no car, no supermarket store within a, a mile. And you see that, you know, that's pretty bad in the south. But then someone earlier mentioned food swamps, and that was a term that I understood, but I had not heard of it um, until recently. But these often occur in low-income, moderate-income, minority neighborhoods, where poverty and food deserts are high, or the percentage of poverty and food deserts are high, and the result is uh, the, the, the unhealthy food choices. So I just plugged into the USDA uh, website uh, looking at uh, the green areas are the low income and 
low access areas. So green is one, one mile in 10, 10 miles. Uh, and that was the traditional or the original food desert measure. And then when you look at that at a lower rate um, of 10 or lower distance of, of a half a mile, um, the landscape changes. And so community gardens, urban agriculture are ways to improve those, the access to uh, healthy foods or healthy produce, but community, community gardens also serve a different purpose. You know, in addition to the quality produce, it's a way to get children engaged. It's a way to keep them from um, the ills of the city, uh, having them right there working with their parents or relatives. Um, it's also a way to engage the older population. Um, there's this really great documentary or uh, segment of Dan Rather's uh, I think it was called Up on the Farm, where he talked about a church in New York City that had purchased a, a parcel of land, a vacant parcel of land, or took it over, I'm not, I don't remember which. And um, that was a place where it was a teaching garden, um, but it was also a place where the older members of the church came together on certain days and they, they shared the stories of the community. And so these can become these great centers of the neighborhood. And of course, uh, farmers market like uh, uh, Eastern Market here in Washington are great ways to also provide healthy food, but also engage the community. And I was surprised that um, you know this example of the new grocery store, uh, the new Safeway grocery store in Petworth, uh, the Petworth neighborhood here in Washington, was. Uh, in, in one of the, the articles that I was reading, um, it talked about how grocery stores are now becoming the triggers for gentrification because, or an in indicator for gentri gentrification, because I think someone mentioned it earlier that this represents higher quality products, of course, but it also is, may not be affordable. And does the grocery store then lead to other, other um, measures of change and displacement in, the, in communities? And so affordable housing, we talked quite a bit about that as well, but affordability in, for the residents as well as for businesses, because as prices increase for residents, it, it also impacts businesses, and can they find uh, places that have affordable rents? Uh, but health, affordable housing also relates to a stable home environment for residents, um, access to quality schools. It also means uh, a decrease in transportation costs and burdens on low and moderate income families who say can live in town as opposed to living farther out uh, in areas that they can uh, afford. And it also means um, more investment in quality schools. And so this, this map shows the affordable housing projects that were financed, financed since 2011 under um, our current mayor, uh, Vincent Gray. And we have a, a new mayor elect who, who is committed to uh, making affordable housing. But how do these things get caught up in economic and political processes? How does affordable housing um, kind of uh, withstand the, um, the changes in political leadership. And um, I was talking to uh, Brendan Shane over lunch, and we were talking about how the height limitations here in Washington City are really hindering our ability to keep housing affordable because developers can't build up. And so are those, uh, we've talked some, somewhat about tools, um, this is an example, this is an image, rather, of the Hyattsville, Maryland Arts District. And, and some of the literature talks about how arts districts can be catalysts for affordable housing. Um, this is on Route 1 in Prince George's County. It transformed from a, um, a corridor of car dealerships to one that's becoming 
much more vibrant. Um, but we've got to look at those tools and flexibility and zoning um, to, to make these types of developments possible. And finally, um, I think it really comes down to community engagement, it's something else that was discussed quite a bit uh, today. It wasn't me. <laughs> 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 yeah. So Dan uh, spoke this morning um, in the Detroit Future City Project um, about not taking a top-down approach, but it really needs to engage people um, and, and hopefully a, a cross-section of the community in terms of age, um, ethnicity and race, and um, gender and class, and you know, you really need to um, work through as many of the organizations that, that exist. Um, the Sustainable DC, program I think was very help, was very good at trying to set up a process, a community engagement process that brought a cross section of the community of the city together. And so there were the big meetings with um, I think hundreds of people down to the very small uh, very small groups. But all of this is geared towards listening and getting people's inputs and comments because it's these pieces of paper, these uh, points of information that I think are critical uh, because the community, they live, live there. We're the experts, we're the ones who bring the knowledge that um, will help to kind of uh, synthesize their, their points of view, but um, listening to the residents and not just the residents, but all of the community stakeholders is very important. And I think we really have to listen to the young people. You know, listen to the kids. Um, I had a student who was working in a fifth grade um, class, working at an elementary school in the city, and I would come and talk with, to the students about architecture and planning. And I, I can't tell you how interested and engaged 10-year-olds are. It's such, such a wonderful age. I don't have kids myself, so I can say that. But, um, <laughs> right. Ten, let's keep them at ten, or a revolving group of uh, ten-year-olds. But, but engaging with this, the young people, I think they've got amazing insight. Um, and in some cases, I think they're much more um, knowledgeable than my graduate students. And so, some of the... That's probably the peak of life. <laughs> <laughs> right. So some of the things that um, you know, I think are, are lessons uh, from foreign com community engagement are bringing residents and community members to the table early and often. You know, it's, it needs to be an inclusive process, open, and, uh, so that you understand, you can get those views of what might be the alternatives to development proposals. Um, the, the, like I said, open dialogue it should be encouraged, but also including representative city agencies, so planning, transportation, economic development, housing, health and human services, all of those different um, agencies that impact quality of life and livability issues. And I won't read this, read the rest of them, but you know, developing monitoring and mitigation tools I think are very important. Um, and being holistic is also we've got to not just look at the physical and the environmental, but also look at those social um, and economic factors and conditions with the intent of outcomes of uh, the just and equitable society. And so Matthew mentioned the High Line uh, Park in New York City. And I think that's a great example of community engagement where you know, two guys at a community member um, are sitting next to each other in, and at a meeting where the High Line is proposed for demolition, they get together, form the Friends of the High Line uh, organization, and through a series of, um, you know, the snowball starts, and, you know, public private partnerships were critical to um, making that uh, park what it is today. And so, looking at the different tools that are available, um, someone mentioned that earlier today. And so I'll close with this uh, quote, um, communities and neighborhoods that 
ensure access to basic goods that are socially cohesive, that are designed to promote good physical and psychological well-being, and that are protective of the, nat the natural environment are essential for health equity. And um, I think that we really have to strengthen this connection. And I'm saying we, from the architecture and planning community, um, really need to reach out to the public health professionals and do a better job. And it's being done in, in examples like you've heard, um, particularly with the New York um, Active Design Guidelines. Um, and I think that LEAD, and it's been mentioned today that LEAD, uh, the leadership in energy and environmental design is very important. It has gotten us to where we are today, but we've like, we have to look at other rating systems like the STAR communities, and STAR stands for uh, sustainabil Sustainability Tools for Assessing and Rating Communities. Uh, DC has been ranked at this year as the third um, uh, highest ranked or highest starred community, and that's behind Northampton, Massachusetts, and Seattle, Washington. Um, this program looks at, looks beyond the building to look at a number of different um, aspects of a community that make it uh, sustainable and vibrant. Um, I think that uh, we need to do more in terms of health impact assessments as much as we're doing environmental impact assessments. And we also have to look at those stressors and connect the mental health um, community in, in this effort. Um, and at the Eco District Summit uh, back in September, Charles Montgomery, who uh, wrote, I think the book is called Happy Cities, um, said that cities design, cities Cities design our emotional lives and have a strong influence on our social networks. And it's, it's those social, social networks that many of the things that I have um, presented in these slides begin to foster. Um, and so I want to end on that. Um, thank you for this opportunity to be here. Thank you so much. Um, and you can, yeah.